and privileged to be here today. Thank you, Chi Wei, for the very kind introduction. I appreciate all of you staying to the end. What I'd like to explain this afternoon is how we can use pharmacologic strategies to slow the progression of a neurodegenerative disease. And perhaps most importantly, what we've learned about the etiology of these diseases from both developing a pharmacologic agent and also converting human genetic observations into biochemical mechanistic understanding. So in the first half of the talk, I'll cover how we can adapt the chemistry of maladaptive protein homeostasis. And in the second half, tell you about the progress of adapting the biology of protein homeostasis to slow the progression of degenerative diseases if there's sufficient time. So protein homeostasis refers to controlling the conformations, the concentrations, and the locations of proteins in an organism. So protein homeostasis is maintained by the proteostasis network composed of about 2,500 proteins. And these proteins comprise integrated and competitive biological pathways, including um, chaperone, co-chaperone mediated folding pathways. Um, and they utilize numerous enzymes to catalyze slow steps in folding, such as peptidyl prolyl isomerization. So when the polypeptide chain comes off the ribosome, there's an inherent kinetic partitioning that occurs. That is, the polypeptide chain can fold, of course, which is required for function. Alternatively, the polypeptide chain can misfold also with unimolecular kinetics. Alternatively, it can aggregate in a concentration-dependent manner. And this kinetic competition is generally managed very effectively by proteins that consume ATP and combine to other than fully folded states. And in the case that these, this misfolded protein or assembled, misassembled protein are kinetically too stable, these processes are also coupled to both proteasome and lysosomal degradation. And this system usually works brilliantly within the cell to minimize protein misfolding and aggregation. Now, outside the cell is a different story. So of course, once proteins fold, they're not permanently folded. They're in continuous equilibrium with unfolded or partially folded states. And particularly when you inherit a mutated protein from your parents, these partially folded states have a more significant predilection to misfold and or aggregate. And there's no ATP in the extracellular space. There's very few chaperones. And so it's hard to manage these processes. At least when we're young, the immune system tends to take care of uh, excess am amounts of aggregation. But we, when we get older, this is more difficult. So we conceived of this idea, very simple idea actually, that you could tailor a small molecule that bound with high efficiency to the native state. And so long as it enabled the conformational interconversions that are required for protein function, you could maintain function while dramatically slowing the conformational excursions that lead to misfolding and aggregation. And that's the story that I'll, I'll tell you quite a bit about in the first talk, or first part of the talk, um, and maybe the only part uh, depending on time. So these diseases that we became interested in are, are so-called amyloid diseases. They compromise um, memory and brain function. They compromise function of the peripheral nervous system, and they can destroy organ systems, especially problematic when they target the heart. These so-called diseases are called amyloid diseases, and so named for the cross beta sheet deposits that are observed in the extracellular space of these patients. So this is an example of misfolded protein misassembly. 
wherein each layer of this cross beta sheet is a different copy of the protein. So there's millions of copies of the protein in these very long amyloid fibrils. And it was thought that in the brain, these amyloid fibrils compromise uh, synaptic function and therefore compromise um, memory and learning. They make the heart stiffer and so ultimately leading to congestive heart failure. And the thinking was that these amyloid fibrils compress the nerves in the periphery and ultimately cause their demise. I'll tell you today that while amyloid is certainly a component of these diseases, this is not the main driver of the pathology. So the transthyretin diseases are cell non-autonomous or in trans gain of proteotoxicity diseases. So what that means is that the liver secretes most of the transthyretin tetramer into the bloodstream. The protein can then dissociate, misfold, and aggregate into a spectrum of non-native structures, including amyloid fibrils. And I'll have more to say about this process in a minute. And a certain number of the non-native structures then infiltrate the heart and the nervous system and destroy these tissues ultimately, even though these tissues don't make transthyretin. So it's an outside-in proteotoxicity mechanism. And we'll have more to say about exactly how, how that works. Now, these diseases are either sporadic, which means they have the same genotype that all of us have on the Zoom today. So the aggregation of the wild type protein causes cardiomyopathy in over a million individuals. And then you can have mutations in the transthyretin protein that make the dissociation more facile and, and that leads to familial amyloidosis. And the familial amyloidosis can present either as a CNS-centric disease, a cardiomyopathy, or a peripheral and or a central nervous system neuropathy. The tissue tropism of this, these diseases is really significant. So if you have one inherited mutation, you get a cardiomyopathy. If you have another, you get a peripheral neuropathy. Yet another, you get a central nervous system disease, and so on. We presume, but we haven't yet demonstrated, that the different tropisms seem to be dependent on the ensemble of aggregate structures that are made. There's some evidence for that, but the evidence isn't particularly strong. So today, I'm going to outline the pharmacologic and genetic evidence that the that it's actually the process of aggregation that causes these diseases, that causes these degenerative phenotypes. So given that a lot of different aggregate structures are formed at steady state, including amyloid fibrils, we set out at the very beginning to block the entire process of aggregation. And that was in stark contrast to what most people were doing at the time. In fact, billions of dollars have been spent in the clinic on antibodies that target just the amyloid structure or just misfolded protofilaments. And we thought it was important to achieve clinical success to block the entire process of aggregation. Now, just a, a little bit of a, a side note to refresh everybody's understanding. So of course, protein conformations are what enable their function. So if you think about GPCR signaling, of course the GPCR receptors um, are capable of adopting several different conformations. But once the small molecule agonist bind, binds, it freezes out a conformation, changes the intracellular shape and juxtaposition of functional groups present and that allows the G protein to bind, which allows intracellular signaling. So shapes and combinatorial presentations of side chains are what determine protein function. Therefore, if we wanna think about what causes tissue degeneration in these amyloid diseases, we have to realize that now we have 
a very large ensemble of abnormal shapes as a consequence of the buildup of these misfolded forms of transthyretin or A beta in Alzheimer's disease or alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease. And of course, this can cause aberrant intramolecular signaling, aberrant outside in signaling. It can lead to hyperactivation of the immune system that I'm going to talk about next, which is actually probably the second phase of these diseases that actually can become the main phase if you don't intervene soon enough. But the bottom line is that many, many cellular activities are aberrantly activated because you express all these different protein shapes that the organism doesn't normally see. And with time, that leads to cell death. Now, there's emerging evidence that immune cell overactivation, which initially is beneficial, um, becomes a significant driver of neurodegenerative disease as the degenerative disease progresses. So the idea is that, of course, these aggregates that are in the extracellular space, along with other stimuli, activate cells like microglial cells and macrophages in the periphery. And once these cells become hyperactivated, not only do they take out the offensive material, they can also eat synapses and ultimately kill neurons. And that's obviously a significant problem. And there are a number of innovators, some of whom are on the call today, that have um, really helped us understand this um, likely driver of pathology. So of course, the reason this is important is that if you only fix the proteinopathy in patients who have significant overactivation of say microglial cells, they might not respond clinically. So a little bit more about transthyretin. There are three forms that are in the plasma. There's the form that has no ligands bound. There's the form that um, has a small amount of thyroid hormone bound. And there's a form about 50% that has a um, retinol binding protein bound. This is the form that's prone to dissociation, misfolding, and aggregation. So there was enough known about protein amyloid pathology when we started embarking on this project that it encouraged us to do a detailed mechanistic probe of how this protein actually aggregates. And, and that was a good decision, as you'll see. So first of all, the cell biology in the liver. So it turns out that there are more mutations that lead to familial disease than there are amino acids comprising the transthyretin subunits, namely 127. The vast majority of these mutations are secreted at wild-type-like levels. So there's no intracellular quality control per se. Moreover, the folded structure appears to be normal. Now, what the mutations do is make the tetramers, um, the tetramer dissociation process more facile. So they make it faster. And since this is the rate limiting step in aggregation, this is problematic because you end up with a higher concentration of the misfolded monomer which can drive all these abnormal protein structures linked to pathology that I told you about. So when Ted Foss was a graduate student in the lab, he embarked on a series of biophysical and subunit linking experiments to try to understand precisely how the transthyretin tetramer comes apart. And through an elegant list of experiments that I just don't have time to go through today, Ted discerned that the protein actually comes apart about this dimer-dimer interface. That's the weak link. And Marcus Jagger, a uh, uh, staff scientist in the lab, has recently done an, a, a large number of kinetic studies to demonstrate that this is unequivocally the case. Now, what's relevant is that these are the two small molecule or thyroid hormone binding sites that are unoccupied to the tune of 99% in you and I. So this was a good day because we realized we could make 
small molecule mimics of thyroid hormone that were not agonist or antagonist and stabilize this protein and slow down the slowest step in the process of aggregation. So the idea is that by stabilizing the native state, we can block the entire process of protein aggregation from newly synthesized transthyretin. Of course, in the patients, they already have an amyloid load before you start treating them. And there's very little evidence because of the kinetic stability of the amyloid fibrils that you can drive this equilibrium backwards. At least it's very slow. And so the idea is that it would be the newly synthesized transthyretin dissociating, misfolding, and aggregating that was driving these diseases if, in fact, the drugs were um, successful in the clinic. Now, while we were busy at work fashioning small molecules, um, there was a really important genetic observation made from Teresa Calejo and her colleagues in Portugal. So she identified families with this very common polyneuropathy mutation, and half the people in these big families were not presenting with disease at age 30, which would be expected. She was smart enough to sequence these individuals, and it turns out they have a mutation on both of their gene copies. So on gene copy one, they have the pathogenic mutation. On gene copy two, they have a, a so-called interallelic transsuppressor. So we were curious how this worked. And when Per Hammerstrom was a postdoc in the lab, he hypothesized that inclusion of these three 119 MET subunits into a tetramer otherwise composed of the misfolding prone subunits would, would stabilize the native state. But in fact, the way this works is even more interesting. Incorporation of these protective subunits destabilizes the dissociative transition state, increasing the activation barrier for detrimer dissociation. So in, a, in, in, a, in effect, even though these subunits are misfolding prone, they can never get to the monomer, which is required for misfolding because the activation barrier is so high. And this prevents disease onset in these individuals. Now, um, this is just some of the data that shows that. So if you make these tetramers comprised of different stoichiometry where the red subunits are the suppressor subunits, you can see whether you look at fibro formation or the rate of tetramer dissociation, that that rate um, plummets with increasing stoichiometry of the suppressor subunits. Now, as chemists, we don't know how to engineer transition states very well, although you've heard beautiful examples of how it can be done in small molecule with catalysts. But what we know very well how to do is to um, manipulate the activation free energies by virtue of fashioning small molecules that bind to the native state, but much less so to the dissociative transition state. So the stronger the small molecule binds, the larger the activation barrier for tetramer dissociation. And so um, what you may not know about transthyretin is that it was the protein that Colin Blake and Jeff Blaney used at Oxford to introduce the concept of structure-based drug design. And as a consequence, there were lots of ligands known when we started this. Unfortunately, they were all thyroid agonist or antagonist, which was a non-starter for this pro program. So when Evan Powers was a postdoc in the lab, he designed a fair number of molecules, but these simple benzoxazoles turned out to be the drug um, that, that we ultimately um, did a clinical trial on in a company I formed with Sue Linquist and, and then Pfizer um, uh, bought. So unlike the elegant syntheses that my colleagues, uh, Dale Boger and Jin Kwan, uh, you and Phil Barron and others do, um, this is an undergraduate synthesis. The molecule is actually really simple, but that's the beauty, isn't it? That this molecule fits perfectly into the transthyretin protein, it has a dissociation constant of two nanomolar and um, dramatically stabilizes the protein by virtue of a kinetic mechanism that is increases the activation barrier because it doesn't bind very well to the dissociative transition state, but binds very avidly to the native state.
Oh, let's see. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead a couple slides. Okay, so how can we demonstrate in a human being what the dose should be? And I can share with you that the FDA was very concerned about this class of drugs because they were afraid we are going to convert a misfolding disease into a lysosomal storage disease by rendering transthyretin undegradable in the lysosome. So we, we had to come up with a, a way to figure out exactly how much drug we needed in the plasma to stop the tetramer from dissociating, but not to go overboard. So the way we did that is we, we made a different tetramer that is tagged with an acidic sequence shown here. And the idea is that tetramer dissociation um, is rate limiting for subunit exchange. So if you have a tetramer in patient plasma that is either comprised of one um, sequence or two, you can add what we call the readout tetramer, which has these tags on it, and therefore the homo tetramer comes out later in an ion exchange column. Once these subunits start to mix into heterotetramers two and three and four, you can see additional peaks. So if you have enough drug, you shouldn't see any subunit exchange. So that's that, this actually works beautiful in vitro, but then the problem is how do you detect the tetramer over the other 4,000 proteins that are present in um, blood plasma? So um, when Sung Wook Choi was a postdoc in the lab, he conceived of these still beans that also bind avidly to transthyretin and subsequently undergo a reaction with this lysine that has a pKa of about 5.5, as Marcus is, is recently determined and will soon publish. So um, this reaction becomes quite fast. And what's really cool about this is that you take a non-fluorescent protein at say um, 500 nanometers and you, you convert it into a fluorescent protein. So you can detect the tetramers over all the other um, proteins in, in plasma. So that's a fantastic chemical biological probe. And this is actually a Nobel laureate um, that was dosed with this drug orally at at 20 milligrams or 40 or 60. And you can see even at the 20 milligram once daily dose, once daily is all that's required because this drug has a half-life of about 40 hours. So um, the FDA was really excited about the 20 milligram dose and didn't want to give a higher dose. I was adamant that we should use 60. And uh, it took us a, a number of years before we ultimately did that. But you know they had their point. Um, the, the point is that this assay is really good for figuring out the extent of stabilization that you need to see a clinical effect. And we're starting to put guardrails around what that answer is. Now, in terms of going into the clinic, there was no animal model. And in some ways, this was a blessing because we were able to convince the FDA based on the genetic evidence that I already outlined for you that the drug really should work. And so designing the clinical trial was a, a big deal as first in class trials always are. And we ultimately decided on the neuropathy impairment score. Now, this is a, a clinical scale that goes from zero to 244. And it looks at um, sensory neuropathy autonomic neuropathy, lower limb sensory neuropathy. And these are the three big symptoms that are observed in, in transthyretin amyloidosis. Now, this gave us a lot of pause, however, because this clinical scale has been used for all diabetic polyneuropathy trials and every single one of them have failed. But the hope was that this disease progresses faster and we'd be successful. And um, lo and behold, it, it, it did progress more rapidly. And you could see a clear statistically significant differentiation in the blinded treatment group versus the placebo group uh, upon unblinding. And then um, even the 
untreated group stabilized after they were rolled on drug at, at 18 months. Now this is the 20 milligram once daily dose. Now I started getting calls from all over the world when this trial started saying, hey, your drug works. I'm like, how do you know that? It's a double blind placebo controlled trial. And they say, well, our patients are gaining weight. They never gain weight. So, um, and only half of them are gaining weight. So um, we were worried about this slope for a while, but eventually it stabilized. Now we don't know why these patients lose weight to this day, but the suspicion is that it's autonomic neuropathy that causes this weight loss. And without treatment, these patients waste to weigh 40 or 50 pounds before they die. So this is a big deal to prevent this. Now, this is a really important slide because if you wait 18 months to dose what by all accounts are demographically equivalent groups, if you start dosing with tefamidus, you get 70% of this patients responding. If you wait 18 months to dose, now only 50% of the patients respond. And you'll see in a completely different group, this data recapitulated in another type of experiment. So the earlier the patients go on to famitis, the better the outcome clearly. So most people now think that these drugs should be used very early. And so a lot of effort has gone into early diagnosis of, of these diseases. Now, before we came on the scene, there was an effective treatment. The treatment involved liver transplantation. So since the liver is the main source of the protein in, on this side of the blood brain barrier, you can get rid of these unstable heterotetramers by transplanting in a wild type organ. The problem is that 10% of these patients died, even though they were pretty healthy. And the reason is, is that their vasculature is very hard to suture. So this is a big problem because you have a familial disease, you have endemic areas, you have a 30 year old that's perceived by the community to be healthy, and then nobody else wants a liver transplant. And that's exactly what happened. Nonetheless, almost 2000 people were transplanted in the early days in Portugal. And um, you can see that liver trans, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So every blip on this curve is a patient passing away. And on the x-axis is the disease duration. So if you possess the VEL30 met mutation, you can see that 90% you know, of the patients don't live beyond 20 years from day to diagnosis. Clearly liver transplantation is a big advantage in terms of extending lifespan and quality of life. Now, the data for tefamidus are real out to about here. This is sophisticated mathematical um, projection, but clearly this drug is, is transforming the treatment of these patients in terms of survival and quality of life. Now, when Cecilia Monterio, who came to the lab as a registered and practicing neurologist came to get her PhD in chemical biology, on the side, she studied another patient group. And after looking at these patients very carefully using a multitude of clinical metrics, what, what she showed is that 70% of the patients responded very well to tefamidus. But 30% of these individuals that we still can't differentiate demographically behave like there's no, they're not even taking tefamidus, although we know they are from their drug concentrations and other metrics. So, and in fact, the proteinopathy is corrected in these individuals because the non-native forms of transthyretin, which we're getting better at measuring, go very low in these patients, yet they don't respond. So, you know, we, we think that these patients have significant macrophage activation, and that's what's driving the disease. And there's some evidence for that, although it's not as strong as we'd like. And so we have pretty good team now of Scripps investigators and outside investigators who 
are investigating this hypothesis with the hopes of you know, treating these patients probably with two drugs, one that deals with overactivation of the immune system through the innate immune response and the other um, being a drug like tefamidus. Now, I mentioned this business of non-native structures of, of transthyretin in the extracellular space. So this molecule that I mentioned earlier that when it reacts with transthyretin renders the tetramer fluorescent allows us to very accurately measure native TTR concentrations. And so you see that the native concentrations are hovering around about 140-ish micrograms per mil, which is about five, uh, yeah, about four or five micromolar. Now, if you look at total transthyretin using some sophisticated ELISA and related methodology and, and or just old fashioned SDS gels, you see that the total TTR concentration in these VEL30 met polyneuropathy patients is twice what the native population is. So there's a lot of non-native TTR and importantly, it's circulating. And it's heterogeneous enough that it's hard to determine or, or look at by structural methods, although progress is being made. And you can see the diminution in these non-native TTR levels with treatment at 20 milligrams of tefamidus. And presumably now when we go up to the 60 milligram dose, you're, you're gonna see a, a even bigger change here in terms of eliminating um, the non-native transthyretin levels. So subsequent to the tefamidus approval for polyneuropathy, both alnylam and ionis um, have been approved for RNA degrading drugs. So they degrade the messenger RNA for transthyretin to about almost 90% of the messenger RNA is degraded. And so the transthyretin levels are knocked down by more than 80%. And these drugs also are quite effective in slowing the progression of polyneuropathy. However, again, 33% of the patients don't respond to these drugs, okay? So this is a theme, right? That there's a secondary pathology in roughly 30% of these patients that, that, that is overtaking the proteinopathy as the driving force. So all of the pharmacologic evidence to date indicates that it's the newly synthesized protein that is aggregating into a spectrum of structures. And blocking this is what's causing the progression of the disease in rough more than two thirds of the patients to, to become much lower or to stop. Now, what I haven't talked very much about yet is what's going on with the amyloid load in these patients. And even though this has not been directly measured with PET imaging agents like it has in Alzheimer's disease, owing to the, the um, resolution of cardiac imaging, we can very safely conclude that in these patients, there's really been no change in the amyloid load over the several years of, of, of treatment that these patients um, have been um, imaged through that period. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, cardiomyopathy. So um, the walls of the heart expand dramatically in cardiomyopathy, and this expansion is almost entirely due to amyloid fibrils being in the extracellular space. The size and mass of the heart can double as these individuals enter congestive heart failure owing to transthyretin amyloidosis. The amyloid fibrils um, comprising the hearts have been characterized by cryoelectron microscopy. And um, the majority of the protein is in each layer of the beta sheet, although it's, it's cleaved most likely after aggregation since the two parts are always uh, paired. So there was a lot of arguing and arm wrestling over how this trial should be done. And I, I must say that Pfizer and the clinicians were on opposite sides of the 
the tug of war. And ultimately, Pfizer decided that they would look at an all-cause mortality and frequency of cardiovascular-related hospitalization endpoint. At, and they decided to study more than 400 patients for 30 months. And the clinicians wanted to do six-minute walk test and some other things that were um, prevalent in cardiomyopathy trials. So Matt Maurer kind of foreshadowed how this clinical trial was going to come out via his open label data that came out only a couple weeks before the clinical trial results were announced. So he was treating about 100 people with, um, uh, well, 100, more than 100 people total with either tefamidus or a historic group. So these are different individuals than in this group. I can't see the end here because, uh, let's see. Yeah, I can't move that. But I, I recall that was something like 60 or 70. In, in any case, these were either treated with tefamidus 20 milligrams or diflunosel, or Merck's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that we studied, we discovered could be repurposed as a transthyretin kinetic stabilizer. It's not nearly as potent as tefamidus, but its plasma concentrations are very high. And so it ends up being a decent stabilizer. So you can clearly see that, um, again, deaths are prevented in these individuals by taking a stabilizer. The clinical trial didn't reveal this massive separation, but nonetheless revealed a statistically significant separation. Now, what really saved the day is the way that the statistics were done here, which many people have called out as being novel. So you, you compare, you, you do all these comparisons mathematically between the patients that are treated with tefamidus and the placebo group. And that too came out to be um, a p-value of 0 0.0001, although that's not so easy to graph that, unfortunately. Now, again, if you treat early, that is you treat New York class one heart failure patients, so the mild heart failure, the risk of death reduction is 64%. If you wait for the patients to get to class three heart failure, there's a much less significant influence of tefamidus in terms of prolonging life. And this is this has also been borne out in long-term survival studies with the individuals in the placebo controlled trial. So first you see that as time goes by, these groups separate even more. The, the end of this is probably meaningless as there's such small numbers of individuals, but um, clearly there's a, a big separation here. So this is, 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 is looking quite good. Now, both groups were right. In fact, the physicians, um, what they wanted to do showed an effect much earlier, right? Because we had to wait almost 25, 26 months before we saw separation in all-cause mortality and hospitalizations, whereas um, in the six-minute walk test and the quality of life, the group separated early. Now, having said that, um, a trial was just run with another agent that is a little bit more potent than tefamidus, and they banked on seeing a difference in the six-minute walk test after uh, 12 months. And that trial failed because they enrolled individuals that are healthier. So it's very difficult to do this. And you got to be careful you don't get greedy. It's important to run these trials for an appropriate duration. So I mentioned that liver transplantation was the only approach to treat these individuals into about 2011 when tefamidus was approved. And it reduces variant TTR um, serum concentration by 95% and clearly extends lifespan based on the data I already showed you. Now, Teresa Calejo, besides um, making um, wonderful, um, well, she was central in all of these clinical trials reading out. Um, she also decided that it was important to follow these individuals that were transplanted more than a decade ago. And what she started to notice in these individuals is that they were exhibiting focal 
neurological episodes and dementia. Now, the transthyretin in the brain doesn't come from the liver. It can't cross the blood brain barrier. It's secreted by the choroid plexus. And of course, since you only do um, gene replacement therapy in the periphery, in the brain, you still have mutant and wild type being secreted, albeit at an order of magnitude lower concentration. So the pathology takes longer to develop in the brain because of course, aggregation is concentration dependent. So Yoshi Sikajima, a former um, postdoc neurologist in, in the lab, um, did PET imaging on these individuals. And sure enough, after about 12 years or so, you see massive amounts of transthyretin aggregates in the brain. And these focal neurologic episodes really um, start to present themselves. And these are really problematic because people lose consciousness for anywhere from you know, half a minute to several minutes and obviously a problem in terms of the ability to work and drive a car and so on. Moreover, after about 10 years, quite a large number of these individuals, this is probably conservative, it's probably more like 50% of developed dementia. Now, the good news is that tofamidus penetration in the brain isn't too bad, it's not great, but it's, it's anywhere from close to one to one to about you know 40% relative to the concentration of defamidus. And this is at the 20 milligram dose. So we're hoping, but we still haven't got CSF to measure that at the higher dose will be above the transthyretin concentration. And owing to the um, high affinity binding, this should be sufficient to give good stabilization. So um, we've used this uh, same exact approach on light chain amyloidosis. And the problem with light chain amyloidosis is that each patient has a different light chain. So people argue that this was never gonna work because the binding site's gonna be different in every person. But um, when um, Nick, Nicholas Yen and uh, Gareth Morgan got together and did a really clever high throughput screen, they discovered a small molecule binding site that was highly conserved in light chains. And we're pushing very quickly now to get kinetic stabilizers into these patients. This is important because it's really hard to eliminate all the clonal plasma cells. And the idea is, is that if you also had a stabilizer and you eliminated most of the plasma cells that these patients would do much better. So that's the hope. And We'll see when we get into the clinic. Okay, I have five minutes left. I'm gonna skip this slide. Just thank all those individuals that have been um, incredibly um, generous with their time and their scholarly contributions. And in five minutes, tell you kind of where we're going. So what's the problem with Tefamidus? The problem, if you will, is that there are probably 70 amyloid diseases, and you have to fashion a small molecule for every protein that's capable of misfolding and aggregating. Now, many small companies are, are doing that and some major pharmaceutical companies, but we decided to take a slightly different tact, and that was to adapt the protein homeostasis network or the biology to combat these diseases. And in particular, we decided to activate biological degradation because lysosomal degradation is really good at getting rid of kinetically stable aggregates. So um, autophagy is a mechanism by which a double membrane engulfs proteins, aggregates, damaged organelles, and so on, takes them to the to lysosome, there's a very complex biology that allows the autolysosome to fuse with the lysosome to recycle the building blocks, making up nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and so on. So unlike the proteasome, which degrades proteins, the lysosome degrades everything. And that's really important because many of these aggregates contain RNA, they contain lipid, and, and so on. Moreover, virtually mutations that slow down virtually every step of autophagy 
result in neurodegenerative diseases upon aging. So it's not unreasonable to think that if we could make this process more efficient, maybe we could intervene. Now, the big problem has been doing a high throughput screen. And so we ultimately decided the way to do this was to make lipid droplets by feeding cells oleic acid. They really don't like that. So they make triacylglycerides and put a membrane around the triacylglycerides. And then these are degraded in the lysosome by the process of autophagy. And so if we have an autophagy activator, we should see a result like down here versus the vehicle control versus a lysosomal inhibitor, which um, we've seen um, compounds that fall into all three categories. So we set the bar really high. We wanted compounds that reduced um, lipid droplet area by a factor of two without killing the cells and at concentrations no higher than five micromolar. And what we are really interested in is compounds unlike um, rapamycin, which inhibit mTOR to accomplish macroautophagy. We wanted to discover mTOR independent mechanisms, and that's because we intend to use these drugs in aged individuals. And the last thing we want to do is um, immunosuppress them. They're already at higher risk for infectious disease. So hence the uh, desire to discover mTOR independent lysosomal flux activators. And indeed we've done that, although I just don't have time, especially now to show you all the data. I'm just gonna tell you, show you one pathobiological result. So it turns out in neurodegenerative disease patients, um, they have these long axons that separate the cell body from the, the termini, the synaptic connections with the next neuron. And in these neurodegenerative disease, you get these huge inclusions. And these inclusions, as you can see in data from the Oncolata lab, in an individual with the wild type prion protein, the same protein that you and I have, these um, prion proteins are packaged into vesicles. They zip back and forth across the axon. This is a form of the prion protein where the octopeptide repeat region is expanded to familial patient range. And you can see that the um, trafficking's really slowed down. And the Oncolata lab published a beautiful paper in um, Science Advances showing the biological mechanism by which these um, prion protein aggregates are forming within vesicles in the axon. So the obvious question was, could we clear these traffic jams and degrade these aggregates through a certain mechanistic class of our lysosomal flux activators? And you can do this experiment because they have beautiful methodology for imaging these axons using turf microscopy. And you can see that with rapamycin, which recall is an mTOR inhibitor that activates autophagy, you, you clear these aggregates and that wasn't known. So that, that was a really cool result in itself. And then in addition, um, compounds that work by an mTOR independent mechanism, and we're getting pretty close to understanding the mechanism, they also in a dose dependent fashion clear these aggregates. And what's absolutely remarkable is that vesicular trafficking um, is normalized or restored, which is a phenomenal result. And so I, I, I think um, this along with the fact that, so you can see that graphically here, right? That is the aggregate lowering as a function of dose. So it, I think this is five nanomolar. It's just too low to um, activate macroautophagy, but this screening hits very potent. So it 50 nanomolar and higher, you get nice clearance of aggregates versus the vehicle control. And um, I'm going to close not by showing you any more data because we're at 525, but just say that the Haggerty lab has also shown in a tauopathy model that these compounds work um, very well indeed in both clearing tau aggregates and preventing these um, patient-derived iPSC neurons from um, undergoing cell death owing to um, tau aggregation. So um, I want to thank the autophagy team. Um, we only started this project a few years ago. We didn't even, we hardly knew how to spell autophagy when we started this, but we've learned a lot in the process. And I, I want to thank my 
colleagues for really digging into the biology and the pharmacology and hopefully in a few years we'll be able to tell you about clinical results but not today so it's been a privilege and i'll stop there <laughs>